So in today's video, what we want to look at is, in my opinion, the right way to view Green's theorem. So Green's theorem is this relation on line integrals that we learn about in any kindergarten vector calculus course. It's very confusing for students. It's not clear at all why there's these minus signs, why you can express a line integral over a curve in terms of a double integral over the region it bounds. All of these theorems like Stokes theorem, divergence theorem, all this stuff, it's just a whole bunch of ad hoc nonsense that you just walk away at the end without having any idea of what's going on. To anyone who has any knowledge of what's referred to as Durham cohomology, a vector calculus course is just the one, one or two facts repeated over and over again. The purpose of this video is to illustrate, or at least give you some idea of this higher perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop the right language to talk about these theorems in vector calculus. Namely, we're going to talk about the wedge product and the exterior derivative and things like that. You won't have to worry about the jargon necessarily, but you'll at least see why things are occurring and give a and we'll, we'll give a clean presentation of this material. Okay, that's enough chit chat. Let's get into it. Okay, so let's recall the statement of Green's theorem. Recall that Green's theorem says that the line integral over the closed loop C of P D X plus Q D Y, where P and Q are functions of two variables, is given by the double integral over the region it bounds, which we've denoted by D, of partial Q partial X minus partial P partial Y of DX DY. Now to have some intuition and actually understand what Green's theorem is saying, let's recall the fundamental theorem of calculus that we learned in kindergarten. So the formulation I'm going to take here is that the integral of a to b of f prime of x dx is equal to f of b minus f of a. So if we look at the graph of f prime of x, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that if we take two points a and b, then the area underneath this graph is determined by the value of another function, namely f, at these boundary points alone. Now, a priori, we need to know every point between A and B to determine the area, but the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that it's actually only determined by the values of a separate function, namely its antiderivative, at the endpoints. Now, to get further insight on the fundamental theorem of calculus, what we'll do is we'll rewrite the integral from A to B of f prime of x dx as the integral over the closed interval A, B, f prime of x dx, for us, this is going to be the same. And what we can do is we can also write f prime of x as df dx. And what we can also do is write f prime of x as df. And we can also write ab as the boundary of the closed interval ab. So to denote the boundary of a set, we use this partial symbol. So the set containing only the elements ab is denoted by partial of the closed interval ab. So now what the fundamental theorem of calculus says is that the integral over the closed interval AB of df dx is equal to the integral over the boundary of the closed interval of AB of f dx. Now just to make this subsequent remark more transparent, what we can do is it can actually replace df with partial f, since we're only dealing in the one variable situation, this is all equivalent. And so we've written the fundamental theorem of calculus as the integral over the closed interval AB of partial f dx is equal to partial of the closed set AB, in other words, the boundary of the closed interval AB of f dx. From this way that we've written the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's clear that integrals are not necessarily the opposite of derivatives. What's happening is that the opposite of the derivative is actually the boundary of the region of integration. So the way in which this discussion that we've had so far is formalized is through what's referred to as Durham cohomology. This is a subject within differential geometry that is covered within any standard text on Ramanian geometry or differential geometry, or be it, it's quite an advanced concept, uh, subject to typically a graduate course. The this can be found, for example, in Yost's Ramanian Geometry and Geometric Analysis, or my favorite book on the subject, which is uh, Peter Peterson's Ramanian Geometry, the second edition. These are excellent books, which I would highly recommend. I initially learned Ramanian Geometry from Yost's book under Ben Andrews, and then as a graduate student, I worked through 
and continue to work through uh, Peter Peterson's Romanian geometry book. To continue this extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus in a hope to get some insight on Green's theorem, what we'll now do is ask the question of how can we formulate area, the notion of area, this abstract idea, into an operation that we can perform on vectors or something or some type of object we're familiar with in order to get a language that's actually fruitful. So we want to develop a language on vectors or on some type of objects that furnish an understanding of what area is. So let's restrict our consideration to vectors. So let's consider the vector v, which is the vector 1, 2, and the vector u, which is given by 2, 1. What we can of course do is translate v to the endpoint of u and u to the endpoint of v and form this parallelogram. Now, of course, from kindergarten linear algebra, we know that the area of this parallelogram is just going to be given by the determinant of the matrix whose columns are given by u and v, but we'd like to express that in an operation. We would like to know whether we can actually construct an operation on vectors such that if we take a vector u, take a vector v, apply this operation, it gives us the area of the parallelogram. This will be an important key step in the development of this formalism. So let's assume we have such an operation. We'll denote it by this wedge symbol here. So by u wedge v, we're going to mean the area of the parallelogram formed by u and v. To get an understanding of exactly what properties this operation would have, what we'll do is we'll write u as a i plus b j and v as c i plus d j. Now the wedge of u and v is then just a i b j wedge c i plus d j. We'll assume that it's distributive, so we can foil it out in the sense that we'll now have a i wedge c i plus d j plus b j wedge c i plus d j, and then this would further expand to a c i wedge i plus a d i wedge j plus b c j wedge i plus b d j wedge j. Now, of course, i wedge i is the area of the parallelogram formed with i in itself, and j wedge j is the area of the parallelogram formed with j in itself. That's just the area of a line, which of course is zero. So now what we can do from what we've just calculated is that in this u wedge v calculation, the first term and the last term, which are the i wedge i and j wedge j terms, are both zero. What we're now left with, therefore, is that u wedge v is ad i wedge j plus bc j wedge i. And now we want to understand how does this wedge operation behave if we switch the order. So what is the difference between i wedge j and j wedge i? So we'll recall that i wedge i and j wedge j, well, they're areas of lines, so they're going to be zero. And in particular, I can consider the parallelogram formed with i plus j and itself. Again, that's just going to be the area of a line, so it will also be zero. So we have that zero is equal to i plus j wedge i plus j. Expanding this out, we get i wedge i plus j plus j wedge i plus j, which we further expand to i wedge i plus i wedge j plus j wedge i plus j wedge j. This is exactly what we did before. Again, the first term and the last term will cancel, and we see that zero is equal to i wedge j plus j wedge i. In other words, we get the following anti-symmetric property, which is that i wedge j is equal to minus j wedge i. So when we switch the order with respect to this wedge operation, we pick up a minus sign. So now if we return to our calculation here, namely that u wedge v is ad i wedge j plus bc j wedge i, then switching the order, expressing everything in terms of i wedge j, we get ad i wedge j minus bc i wedge j, which of course we can just write as ad minus bc i wedge j which may surprise you or may not, but that's exactly what the determinant of a two by two matrix is if the matrix is A, B, C, D. So this wedge operation is exactly what we wanted. It gives us the area of the parallelogram of the vectors where the vectors are columns of this matrix.
So this wedge operation gives us exactly what we wanted. We want the area of the parallelogram formed by the vectors u and v. Now this operation on vectors is well known. It's, it's known as the wedge product. So the defining properties of the wedge product are that if we wedge something with itself, we get zero. Again, that's because it's the area of a line. A parallelogram formed by a vector in itself is going to be a line with area zero. And it has the following anti-symmetry property, which is that u wedge v is minus v wedge u. Okay, so let's see how this new language tells us anything new or gives us any insight into Green's theorem. So recall that Green's theorem, again, is the line integral over a closed loop C of P dx plus Q dy. That's the double integral over the region it bounds of partial Q partial x minus partial p partial y dx dy. What we're going to do is we're going to write omega as p dx plus q dy, and we want to compute the derivative of omega, which we denote by d omega. Now that's going to be the derivative of the first function dx plus the derivative of the second function dq dy. Now we're dealing with a function of two variables and we're going to use the following definition of the derivative, which is that if we have some function f, then df is partial f partial x dx plus partial f partial y dy. This is well known to be what's referred to as the exterior derivative, but the name is not important here. So if we use this definition of the derivative, what we see is that dp is going to be partial p partial x dx plus partial p partial y dy. And then we have the dx plus now dq is partial q partial x dx plus partial q partial y dy, and then we'll have dy at the end. Now, what's implicit here is that there are actually going to be wedges here. So whenever we write dx dy or dx dx, implicit in that is that there is a wedge. These are referred to as covectors, which can just be thought of as vectors for this discussion. And we're pairing them in such a way that we get area. That's what integrals yield. So what we have is partial p partial x dx wedge dx, plus partial p partial y dy wedge dx, then similarly partial q partial x dx wedge dy, plus partial q partial y dy wedge dy. This is just distributing the previous line. Now recall that the wedge product has the property that if we wedge something with itself, that will give us the area of a line and that'll be zero. So immediately we see that the first term and the last term here partial p partial x and partial q partial y terms both vanish and we're left with partial p partial y dy wedge dx plus partial q partial x dx wedge dy. Now the other property of the wedge product was the anti-symmetry. So if we switched the order of what we were wedging, we would pick up a minus sign. In particular, what we see is that what we have here is minus partial p partial y dx wedge dy plus partial q partial x dx wedge dy. And then of course we can combine this and just write this as partial q partial x minus partial p partial y of dx wedge dy. And if we compare this with Green's theorem, what we see is that the left hand side is the integral over the boundary of d. So we can write c as partial d of omega. And we can write the right hand side, namely this double integral, as the integral over the entire region you can keep the double integral notation if you prefer, of d omega. And what this right-hand side of Green's theorem is saying is that we have the integral over the entire region of the derivative. And so in particular, Green's theorem is saying that the integral over the boundary of omega is the integral over the entire region of d omega. When we write it like this, symbolically we're only referring to regions in the plane, but it holds in higher dimensions. This is, in its full generality, it's referred to as Stokes' theorem. What I hope has been made clear at this point now is that Green's theorem, when expressed in this language of wedge products and, in my opinion, in, expressed in the right language, is nothing more than the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus, which in its great generality is Stokes' theorem, is a deep theorem. It's highly non-trivial and in fact, when I was an undergraduate learning this stuff, I remember that one of the lecturers said that, you know, 
you're, you're allowed to have your favorite serum. You can, you're, every, every mathematician gets the right to choose their favorite serum, whatever serum is most significant to them. But no mathematician gets to choose their second favorite theorem because that's Stokes theorem. Stokes theorem has so many applications. It's, it's so important in, in a field of mathematics known as cohomology. And cohomology is really one of the, one of the big machines in mathematics today. If you'd like to see how actual cohomology can be, uh, used in very concrete ways without getting bogged down in all this jargon, I'd suggest looking at the series of videos I made on Euler's number, where the Euler's number admits a geometric representation in the sense of can, can it be formalized in a geometric way? Can it be given a geometric interpretation? I'll have the link to those videos in the description down below.